The concept of a railless train might seem redundant to a certain extent. However, during the 1950s, within the pages of a specialized magazine for the Canadian Aluminum Production Company, Aluminum Limited, an innovative idea was presented that brought this concept to life, combined with the potential use of aluminum for the bodies of heavy-duty units. The inventor of these enormous machines, known as land trains, was Robert Gilmore Latourneau. He relied entirely on a diesel-electric propulsion system, which, while quite common in locomotives or special military equipment, made him a pioneer in integrating these mechanisms for all-terrain ground transport purposes. These units were quite advanced for their time and were designed for large cargo transports in both desert and remote Arctic environments. As a result, various units were tested for many years in the Arctic North, as well as in the Yuma Desert in Arizona. Letourneau's proposed system involved integrating electric motors into each of the wheels, both of the main unit and the trailers. The main power supply was a diesel engine that acted as a generator. Although this concept was implemented in multiple robust machinery designs created by Robert, and he gained a lot of experience from these developments, all these attempts resulted in purely experimental equipment. It wasn't until 1953 that the development of what would become one of the most unusual and eye-catching vehicles began through his company Latourneau, based in Texas. This vehicle was conceived under the concept of being the first railless train. Named the VC-12 Turna train, this initial unit remained simple, reminiscent of the earlier experimental machines designed with the diesel-electric propulsion system. Initially, this unit was equipped with a 500-horsepower Cummins VT-12 engine, allowing it to pull up to three trailers, each weighing 20 tons. Later, the design was updated with the integration of a second engine, resulting in a gross power of 1,000 horsepower. This enhancement enabled it to pull up to seven trailers simultaneously, achieving a transport capacity of around 140 short tons. This unit was primarily designed for timber extraction operations in forests, where suitable transportation routes were lacking. To achieve this, it harnessed the traction provided by the electric motors integrated into each wheel of the trailers, as well as the great buoyancy of the massive tires. Because of this, demonstrations of its capabilities were conducted around its headquarters in Texas. The vehicle was showcased not only in wooded areas but also on roads and even in urban areas of the city, demonstrating its impressive ability to turn and maneuver. Although this concept was presented to the U.S. Army Transportation Research and Development Command, an official order for this first model was never placed by this entity. However, as the vehicle gained traction in the transportation sector, its significant potential for future projects was taken into consideration. During this same period, in the mid-1950s, the governments of the United States and Canada embarked on an ambitious project known as the DW Line, which required the transportation of thousands of tons of materials and equipment to bases located in remote areas with extremely cold conditions. To accomplish this, they entered into various contracts with transportation companies like Alaska Freight Lines, who, upon learning of Letourneau's proposals, signed a contract with the company for the construction of a new unit called the VC-22 Snow Freighter. Designed under strict requirements, this new model required a configuration consisting of a central unit and five trailers, capable of transporting 150 short tons. Additionally, it needed to be able to cross rivers up to 1.2 meters deep, 
and operate in temperatures as low as minus 55 degrees Celsius. It was powered by two 400 horsepower Cummins engines, resulting in a unit formed by a train that was 84 meters long. A notable aspect is that this unit was built in an extremely short time, a true engineering feat. The construction contract was signed on January 5, 1955, and just six weeks later, on February 17, 1955, the unit was completed, subsequently painted and sent to Alaska. Although the VC-22 Snow Freighter successfully completed its first transport, it suffered an accident upon returning from its mission. This caused a fire that rendered the unit inoperable by damaging its electrical lines. As a result, this vehicle remained stranded for many years until eventually, the permits were obtained to transport it back to Alaska, where it still remains alongside one of the main roads in the state. Concurrently with the Dew Line project, Letourneau secured funding offered by Tradcom to develop a new model of these ground trains. The result was a new unit known as the TC-264 Snow Buggy, intended for military use. This vehicle featured enormous 3-meter diameter tires, while the power for its electric motors came from a single Allison V-1710 engine running on aviation fuel. The outcome was a unit with exceptional buoyancy, capable of traversing tundra and soft snow. It was sent to Greenland for multiple testing purposes. Impressed by the results of the snow buggy in late 1954, the government requested Letourneau to incorporate some of the key features of the first model, the VC-12 Turna train, into this new concept. Produced under the name YS-1 Army Snow Train, the Army later renamed it Logistics Cargo Carrier Snow Train. It consisted solely of the main power unit, equipped with a 600-horsepower Cummins VT-12 engine and three trailers, together spanning 52.7 meters and capable of carrying loads of 45 short tons. Likewise, a new design was adopted, featuring a narrower cabin layout that allowed the massive tires to be positioned on the sides rather than underneath it, enabling passage through narrow paths. Additionally, the main unit was divided into two parts, granting it articulated steering capabilities. The front section housed the main control cabin and crew quarters, while the rear section was utilized as the engine room accommodating the engine along with the fuel tank and a crane for assisting in wheel removal or replacement tasks. Although this unit was operational for several years and underwent multiple performance tests in different environments, its usage started to decline in the early 1960s. By 1962, it completed its final cargo transport. Today, this imposing machine stands on permanent display at the Yukon Transportation Museum in Whitehorse. Despite the gradual decline in the use of the LCC-1, the tests proved successful enough for the military to once again commission Letourneau to develop the ultimate railless train. Taking a similar concept to its predecessor, the design for the terrestrial train TC-497 MK2 was given the green light in 1960. After about a little over one year of construction, the first trials of this unit began in February 1962. The Mark II featured a 6x6 chassis with the characteristic massive wheels, boasting a height of 9.1 meters, Regarding the dimensions, this unit reached a magnitude that is difficult to comprehend, as it pulled 13 trailers extending to almost 175 meters and offered a loading capacity of 150 metric tons. Due to the total length, an innovative steering system was implemented, allowing the trailers to start turning individually at the same point as the truck. One of the most radical changes in this model was the replacement of the Cummins engines, 
which had always been used with gas turbine engines, as they provided greater power and lower weight. Specifically, four Saturn 10 MC engines with 1,170 horsepower were used, with one integrated into the control car and the other three distributed throughout the unit. Sadly, the development of these projects began to slow down in the mid-1960s due to budget constraints, leading them to be categorized as unnecessary experimental expenses. Furthermore, the development of heavy-lift helicopters rendered most of the advantages offered by land trains obsolete as helicopters enjoyed greater maneuverability, adaptability, and speed. The MK-2 never had the opportunity to prove its worth except for a few conducted tests. What little remains of this imposing machine is located at the Yuma Proving Ground Heritage Center, while the rest was sold as scrap. Letourneau continued with the development of machinery powered by diesel-electric systems, venturing back into the earth-moving business. While not abandoning the creation of their unique and massive machines, they manufactured equipment such as excavators and large-capacity side-dump trucks. However, the growing competition in the market, as well as the unpredictable and experimental nature of their products, led the company to be sold in 1970 to Marathon Manufacturing Company, based in Houston, Texas. This hasn't prevented the presence of Robert Letourneau from remaining strong. In the year 2000, they built the L2350 front loader, which to this day remains the largest of its kind in the world. Furthermore, machinery from this company can still be found around the world including cranes, forestry loaders, and equipment for oil plants. Nevertheless, the legacy of these impressive transport machines has been immortalized in the world's largest monster truck, called Bigfoot. This show truck, based on a Ford F250 pickup, is believed to have its wheels sourced from the LCC-1 model, although there is also speculation that they could be from the TC-497 Overland Train MK2. Thank you so much for sticking around until the end of the video. We hope you enjoyed it and found it valuable. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel so you won't miss any of our upcoming videos. We can't wait to see you in the next one.